welcome to our artist interview series in the exhibition Graphic Pole, Contemporary Prints from the Collection at the Nasher Museum of Art at Duke University. And today I'm talking to Pedro Lash, and we're standing here in front of his piece Latino a America from 2003 to 2020. It's a mixed media installation uh, with these printed maps, digitally printed maps, um, or root guides as they're called. Um, and Pedro, to start out, I just wanted to, um, wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the series in general, because these are just a few from the series, um, and then these works specifically. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Molly. And uh, this, I mean, it's, it's great to have this work in the midst of so many other prints in this exhibition. Um, the, in terms of the, the work itself, it, it has to do a lot with, with migration uh, and, and mapping. You know, when we go to school and we're taught about maps, we're often given the impression that it is governments who decide what language gets spoken where and, you know, where the border mm -hmm. lies and so on. But when you actually look at the reality of our lives, uh, these are kind of fictions. You know, there's very few borders that actually have a physical line that separates two countries, mm -hmm. if you're actually in that territory. But also the languages we speak actually have a lot more to do with migrations than with governments, you know? So, uh, so in this particular case, in the Latin America series, uh, what we're talking about is the, the kind of migration that moved from what we formally call Latin America, which officially begins here, right, down from Mexico to Brazilians often don't want to be included there in this designation, right? But with the massive migration from the last few decades from that, this part of the continent to the north, to the United States uh, proper, uh, I believe a massive transformation of culture has happened. Um, the, this country is the only one in the continent that calls itself America and gives, gives in the rest of the mm -hmm. continent, America is the continent, mm -hmm. not one country, right? And so kind of the U.S. has claimed in the English language the singular and given us the plural, meaning the rest of the you know, countries of the Americas. We are the Americas and this is America, you know? And so the, in a way, this project is a bit of a response to that, a, co a controversial response, because mm -hmm. of course I understand in the US there's many populations in addition to Latinos. I don't, I don't mean to claim the entire country for Latinos. It's just a bit of a provocation for thought of thinking what happens to the entire continent when the United States becomes a Spanish as well as English speaking country, for example, right? Um, so that's kind of the, the, the map in itself as an icon, as an okay. image. As a print, uh, I wanted to really do a work that isn't only about migration, but actually migrates. So what you're seeing is a digital print that starts exactly the same, but the idea is that you can, tr you can migrate or travel with the print itself. So I hand it out, I give two copies to each participating individual, and they look, they're folded, they can fit in your purse or in your pocket. Uh, and people migrate with them. So if you're someone who travels by plane, you know, so certain people travel by plane, their maps end up looking basically the same as I gave it to them, you know? <laughs> if you're uh, someone like my friend Cornelio Campos or Vicencio Marquez, many people who I've, I've worked with in the series who have to migrate in different forms, your map ends up looking completely different, right? And so in that regard, I combined the, the, the notion of the print of it looking the same, like we assume mm -hmm. prints can create multiples of the same looking image, mm -hmm. that gets balanced with a counterpoint of the uniqueness of each image, right? What each person does to their map. And in that regard, they are like, Duchamp had this series of, that, that he called uh, unhappy ready-mades, where he, he would leave this geometry book lying in the wind and see how, what the wind and, <laughs> and the rain would do to that book, you know? And most people don't know about this particular ready-made because it's not one of his, it's hard to sell something that has been destroyed by the rain, you know? <laughs> but uh, but so, it, so it's a, a bit of a reference to that, but it's also, an, I, I think of these as portraits. I mean, there's one tendency when we're dealing with immigration and, and, and migrants, right? Of always, like a lot of my students often want to give voice and give image to people who have been deprived of representation, you know? And the default uh, thing to do for that is to create a portrait, to make an image, to put pictures all over the place. 
And in my experience, actually, a lot of immigrants don't want their picture plastered all over the place. Mm -hmm. In fact, they feel quite vulnerable, mm -hmm. you know? These three are all North Carolina arrivals. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think when, when we were considering what to put in the show from the series, we decided that Cincinnati is in North Carolina, and North Carolina has been the largest source, you know, in terms of immigrants from Latin America across the United States. The last two U.S. censuses have shown that, that this is the state with largest by mm -hmm. percentage rate uh, immigration from Latin America. And so uh, the first set in, in, the, in the Latin America print series, the Root Guide series, uh, of these maps that migrate, that people migrate with, the first set was in New York. You know, I was still living in New York. I, they, we presented them for the first time at my solo show at the Queens Museum in mm -hmm. 2006, just as the massive immigrant rallies were going on, you know, so it quite resonated. Um, and, and so this, the next set was in North Carolina, which is, that's where these are from. And we also have like a Southern California set mm -hmm. and, a, and a, a Canada set, Montreal, because people often forget that we have further <laughs> north, you know, as part of the continent. Um, and so I, I love to show them sometimes all together whenever possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they, they speak better in groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, the first time that we've shown three, three prints from only North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So it's, okay. uh, to me, it's important that you also see that range of, of maps that have been affected in very different ways. One that has been heavily soiled, you know, with dirt, and one that has spilled ink, but otherwise looks fairly, you know, unaffected, and then this one that has been seriously wrinkled and, and, and actually lost parts of it. Pedro, I've been asking all of our um, interviewees why the printmaking method, why the print process, what was it about uh, printmaking um, that uh, made it important for you to use that technique for your piece. Um, it sounds like it's, it's, it's an inherently important part of the piece that it be mobile, um, that, it, that uh, the people carrying the guides could put them in their pocket, um, thus a print on a piece of paper. Um, but is there anything about the, the sort of type of print that you chose, uh, this digital format um, um, that you'd like to talk about? Why, why did you make the maps in the way that you did? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I feel like often as when we're conceptual artists, uh, it, it, is, it is falsely assumed that we don't care for technique, you know? And uh, these are in a way conceptual prints, right? Uh, but I was trained as a printmaker. I, I, I was a printmaking technician and instructor at the Cooper Union, which is a really good school, you know. And so I know lithography, silk screen, etching, like you name it, right? Uh, all these techniques. And so to some people, it may seem absurd that I do these prints where like you don't, you don't get to show off any of these <laughs> techniques, right? It's a digital print that then gets used by people to create, you know. But in a way, I, while I do other type of work where that, that, those techniques get shown more, mm -hmm. I think, to me, the challenge here is to think, well, what else can be considered printmaking, you know? So can dirt, can you make prints with dirt, you know? Can you make prints with your fingerprint? Like some of the prints in this series have wine glass stains because one of the participants took it to a bar on the U.S.-Mexico border, you know, right? So, yeah. so that to me is, do we call wine stain now a new printmaking technique? No, <laughs> but in a way it, it, it added to my experience. It makes it interesting to me. You've had a lot of experience with printmaking in your career. Are there any techniques that you've never tried now uh, that you'd like to sort of um, revisit or, or look at more closely in, in your work or just for fun? Oh, I mean, there's so many. I mean, I, I always loved exploring kind of the, like, like for example, I worked with the, with the Japanese printmaker who did Helen Frankenthaler's woodblock prints that oh, wow. sometimes have 50 or 60 layers, wow. you know? And so, like, I, I love technique, you know? But, but the reality is that in the last 15, 20 years, I also miss it. So ironically, more than exploring new techniques, I kind of would love to come back to mm. ones that I used to really practice a lot and love, like, like stone lithography. 
like actual lithographic yeah. stone. Because yeah. there's a whole kind of meditative process. Like you have to grind the stone first, make sure it's perfectly level so it doesn't crack when you print. And then you process it chemically. I mean, a lot. It's a. It's. It sounds ancient by calling it because it's stone, but it's actually. It was only developed very recently, yeah. because in the last you know three centuries, because of the chemistry that is required to understand the, what what happens with the lithographic stone and how it separates the oily parts from the watery parts. And so it's techniques like that that I feel like oh. It's been 20 years since I made the lithographic print. I would love to do one, you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm just getting nostalgic uh, rather than always wanting to try new things. You know? Pedro, do you have any advice for young printmakers, young artists uh, getting started today? My main advice would be to uh, combine the old with the new. I think uh, there's, there's de depending on the generation, there's tendencies to want to throw everything that's been done before into the trash and to start from scratch, or to simply obsess over tradition and, and fetishize these old techniques. And I think, to me, both are unfortunate extremes. You know, I, I, I really love the idea of, um, for example, the, the print shop where I worked at the Cooper Union, we love doing old school techniques, right? Like the techniques that Rembrandt used. But we also have the fanciest, newest, you know, photocopier that you could use to make blanket prints. Like a blanket was basically depositing tone, like the, the pigment that then got fixed. So you could actually stop in the middle of the print with only this, uh, you could separate the CMYK, uh, you know, of, of, of what it was actually a digital print, you know? And, and I love working with both, you know? And so, uh, for 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 students, whether they're young, it, it doesn't have to do with age. It has to do with how much you want to learn and, and, and experiment. I would suggest they combine laser cutting and laser engraving with with traditional, you know, intaglio and engraving, like you name it, right? Like to really not uh, let themselves be told, oh, those two things don't go well with each other. <laughs> like just kind of really play with it. visit pedrolash.com